Uh, I have a few stories that I'll share. Can you hear me okay? Uh, Tom and I have done this session before. This will be a little unique because we tailored it for uh, more on the truck side, and you'll get a little flavor for that. I want to mention uh, a good friend of mine that's here. If, if you enjoy this tonight, he gets credit because he hosted Tom and I to be here. His name is Tom Moore, the local dealer. Tom, can you stand, please? And there's Tom Moore. And another good friend of mine, and again, because I'm so old, I know everyone, and this guy was the farm equipment dealer uh, in the Richmond area, Gene Rose. Is Gene here? There's Gene. Gene and I started, well, we worked together in Kansas City. Uh, a lot of those stories I really can't tell you tonight. <laughs> but, but there are some good ones. Uh, I want to point out that this is, uh, I'm going to give you some trivia. This is just to warm you up for the big show that's coming. And in just a little bit, Tom's going to give you the meat and potatoes. But I want to give you a little a setup on some of the things that uh, you should know. We'll find out if you do, and it'll warm you up for what you're about to learn. First of all, I want to show you this picture. That is me. That really is me. 50 years ago this month, uh, I got my first territory in eastern Nebraska. I lived in Norfolk. Called on your. I, I was talking to Ron one day at a meeting, and he, the first time we met, he says, Vaughn, you know, you don't remember me, but I met you a long time ago. You were at my grandfather's dealership. <laughs> I was 10 years old. <laughs> you no, know, he didn't have to say that. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, let's start with uh, some of the questions. And I'll try to give you some answers, but I'd like to hear your response to this first question I'll ask. Is uh, the infamous day of 1902, year of 1902, four companies joined Cyrus McCormick's original company to form International Harvester. What was the, the name of the largest of these four companies? Anybody? Deering. Deering, yes. Well, what was his name? Charles. William Deering, yes. Here are those companies. The two big dogs were McCormick, uh, Cyrus Jr. at the time, and uh, Deering. Uh, the other three were Plano, uh, which was right there in... I think Plainfield. Yeah, no, no, in Plano's right near us. Yeah. Naperville. Uh, Milwaukee Harvester Company and Warder, Bushnell, and Glesner, which you all probably know as champion. I think many of you were at the Springfield event. Uh, we toured that place, and uh, that's where the champion reapers were made. Next question What major international harvest product is celebrating its 100th anniversary in 2023? Oh, oh, oh. Okay, that was easy. You don't have to say that. <laughs> and what was the name of the engineer most responsible for the farm? Bert Benjamin. Bert Benjamin. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get you for that. <laughs> yes, it was Bert Benjamin, the first row crop tra tractor. Had a, a short turning radius, high ground clearance. It was really ahead of its time. It was a universal uh, product. And uh, another little factoid about this tractor, uh, I'll give you, here's a good test. Who was selling the most tractors in 1922? Nope. Who said Ford? Ford is the answer. Ford is the answer. The Farmall production started in 1923, and by the end of that decade, International Harvester had put Ford aside. International was number one in the market. And this is the guy that uh, was most responsible for that. Question number three. Name the industrial designer responsible for all those important pieces of international harvester history. Lowry. Lowry. Raymond Lowry. Lowry. Raymond Lowry. He's, uh, from, he's French. And uh, you can see the, 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 uh, the building design, the metro, the styling on the 1939M was his. Uh, that, uh, that truck you see there has the same styling on the grill and the IH logo he designed. He was the first uh, industrial designer that any company used uh, at that time. And uh, it was a big deal. Uh, John Deere did the same thing, and what was his name? Uh, what is Dreyfus. it? Dreyfus. Dreyfus, Dreyfus, yes. Uh, they did that. Uh, same kind of thing, and they restyled their tractors, put sheet metal on the front, and so on. 
But this guy, is he's a major dude, uh, well known uh, in the world. In fact, it's an interesting story. When he designed the IH logo, he was on a plane or a train, probably train, train, train. Exactly. and he, he drew it on a napkin. And uh, he took it back to Chicago and showed the management. And uh, of course they liked it. And there's a letter that was at the engineering center in Hinsdale where he probed the guys, did you see my IH and did you like it? And they kept that this framed up in front. Hmm. So anyhow, you can see his effect. Now, this logo is commonly referred to or represents what? <laughs> this group, you've well, did I'm you have a session today? <laughs> That's correct. You know, it's funny. It, it represents the man, a man on a tractor. This is uh, sort of an example of depicting that. I have to admit that I was working for the company at least 20 years before anyone told me that. <laughs> thought, oh my God, is that cool? <laughs> and it is. Okay, name, now these are going to get a little harder. Name at least three foreign countries where international manufactured trucks manufactured not just a symbol. That's different. And from knockdown kits. Can you name three countries? Australia, Canada, one more. France. There's the six. Russia. Canada, Brazil, Mexico, Germany, Australia, Turkey. <coughs> name the IH master engineer who developed the company's first gasoline engine, the first tractor, and the first truck. Anybody? E. Johnson. Very good. Yes. Well, his, his initials were E.A. Johnson. Uh, Johnson. He is. He was probably. I would say the most, the greatest innovator we probably ever had. There's two really great people in our past that we should all remember. One is Alexander. What happened over time with the company, and uh, we had never met. Uh, he sat through my presentation. I went through that uh, that session of. Uh, and the ring, I showed the ring because it was a great way to depict the changes over time. And he, you know, he got pretty excited at the end because here's another guy that isn't weird and likes <laughs> history. So, so we, we talked and, and we've been working ever since. And there's so many great stories for us to tell uh, working on history projects over time. But it's been a real pleasure to work with him. And now I'm gonna turn it over and he's gonna give you the main show. So Tom. That's what you take when you eat beans. <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> uh, gigabyte bomb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's sensitive. It could crash. So thank you, everybody. This has been fun. I heard some great presentations. Uh, yeah, I, I've been coming to these for 10 or 11 years now and seems to get better all the time. Um, but I have, I've got three things here. We're going to cover the McCormick era just a little bit because we're here in Virginia and you've been to the farm. You may know more about this than I do, but I've got a quick summary of what happened before 1902. Um, I'm going to give you an update on what's happened at Navistar, now that we're part of Volkswagen. I get that question anytime I run into anybody, and it's all good, <coughs> but I can give you a few details. My corporate communications people thought I really should give you their presentation, so uh, I cut down to four slides, but um, <laughs> you, you, just some idea of what's happening there. Um, and then I'm, we were invited here by Tom Moore and asked to do a truck history presentation and to not go too much into the scout and the light line because John Clancy was going to cover that. So there are some holes in this in my truck history here, but you know, it's mostly done 
my plan. Um, if I miss something important, tell me afterwards, please. Um, and this presentation is also a little mishmash. I have been making presentations recently for all of our new management from Europe that's come to Chicago. And so I have a, it's, I can see. I do a presentation you might know some of. I mean, I might, I don't want to be talking down to you because you're more expert, but so some of this is, you'll go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that's what I've got to start with. Um, and special thanks to people that have helped me. Voice? Louder. Louder. So, um, Sarah is here somewhere? Yeah, she's in the back. Sarah, th thank you. <coughs> Sarah's given me photos from Australia. Um, and talked me through a lot of that part of our history. Um, George Kirkham, I don't know if any of you know him, a dealer up in Alberta, um, has one of the best truck collections on the planet. And I think knows more about our truck history than anybody. Um, when Fred Crisman passed away, I don't know if you know Fred Crisman's gray, International Harvester Truck Bible. Um, George bought all of Fred's photos. So George has an encyclopedia of photos that's, you know, almost as good as our archives. And our archives has hundreds of thousands of photos. Um, and then to the people that work at the archives who helped me with this, Sally um, and Laura, they, you know, I send them requests for 20 high res photos, and two hours later, they're there in my email. Um, it's a wonderful working relationship. Um, so here is how I tell the story to the people that I work with now. Um, you know, there's four chapters really to our history, starting with Cyrus McCormick's invention of the Reaper in 1831. In 1902, Cyrus's son, Junior, merged his father's company with four other Reaper makers to form International Harvester. In 1906, the company built its first tractor, and in 1907, its first truck. Um, in 1884, under financial duress, which many of you probably may, or may have lived through, um, after 80 years as a leader in both the tractor and truck businesses, the company sold off its ag line and IH name and re-emerged as Navistar. In 2021, Navistar was acquired by Volkswagen and became part of the company's truck and bus business called Freighton. This is our board of directors. Um, most are from Europe. Donna Dorsey there uh, has been with the company 18 years, but everybody else is from either Volkswagen um, or Scania, mostly from Scania in Sweden, which is part of Trayton. Um, one guy from uh, VW in Brazil, um, but it's, it's, it's really working well. Mateus, the, the CEO, is, I've had some meetings with him. He's a great guy. Here is the mission state. There are only four slides on this, so um, they're, they're trying to be sustainable in the mobility business. Um, so trying to unlock businesses, um, business models of digitization, zero emissions, and autonomous technologies. Um, I think it's going to work. Um, they, they're really dedicated to this. Um, for an example, about simple stuff. Um, sustainability. I was in a meeting and there was maybe 20 guys at this giant uh, table and it was going to be a, like a three-day meeting and this was the first one and somebody asked for an agenda and they said oh we don't do that anymore it's online you can find it. We don't. They're just trying to save paper. They're trying to be responsible. It's, I, I think it's a good thing. It's, it's different. It takes adjusting. Um, this is what Navistar is today. Um, we're, we've been the leader in the bus business for ever, it seems. Um, we're really good at it. Um, we're, we're doing well in our medium duty trucks, the box trucks and the local delivery trucks. Um, not as good in highway trucks, but we are making strides. I mean, we really are. Um, we have what, almost 15,000 employees. I know, not like it was in your day, maybe when we had 125,000, but it, it, it's the business is the right size to make it work um, and uh, you know our dealership network a thousand dealers in North America uh, that goes back to Cyrus in the 1850s when he he set up the first dealer franchise network 
you know, he invented that thing. And it's one of the reasons Volkswagen was interested in us. Because, I mean, if they were to buy any other American, I don't think there are any other American truck makers, um, you know, they wouldn't have it. It'd take them years to build a dealer network like that. Um, and here, people really ask me, so what does this merger mean? Is it really a good deal? And if you look at this, yeah, everything about it works. We, we're sharing R&D. And, and we, I don't know, eight years ago, six years ago, we were gonna do a 15 liter diesel engine. Um, and the cost to develop it was going to be a billion dollars. We didn't have a billion dollars. So, you know, we're sharing R&D with the second largest automotive company in the world now, Volkswagen. So, we can purchase things like we have never can't, could before. I mean, the price of things comes down when you buy in bulk. I mean, um, and modularization. We're, we're doing that, at, we were doing that before the merger, but now we're trying to make common parts. And it just makes sense to have fewer parts that you can share across the globe. So all in all, it's a good, it's a good thing. Okay, a little bit about the McCormick business before, uh, before International Harvester. I think you know this. You know, Cyrus worked on his father's farm, um, developed the first Reaper. Um, you know, with, without him, we, we would not be here today. Um, he was 22 years old, reworked some of the key engineering and uh, you know the, the rest is history uh, here's a better view this is a reproduction reaper uh, from 1931 for, for the 100th anniversary but that's it's such a basic basic machine Vaughn put one together a few years ago back in the 30s <laughs> and I stood there and handed him two tools but it was it was impressive um, here you, many of you were probably there today um, at, at, when I show this to the Europeans, and they, they gasp, like, you, you can show us exactly where your company started? I said, yeah, in the basement there. And, and they just like, they go gaga. They can't believe that we can pin this down to one place in one moment. Um, you probably know all this, but before the Reaper, it took uh, two workers to cut two acres of grain in a day. By necessity, farms were small. You have, I mean, you know what, I'm, I'm a suburbanite. I've never, I've driven one tractor, two tractors. I, I'm not a farmer, but grain is ripe, but just a, you can't wait two weeks to cut it. And so, so farms were small. Um, and this, people ask me how important the reaper was. And this I get oohs and ahs on too. And I don't know how many of you know this, um, but it's really difficult to overstate the importance of the reaper. Um, McCormick, a McCormick reaper appears in the Roman mythology themed fresco on the dome over the rotunda of the US Capitol building in Washington, DC. This was done almost certainly with Abraham Lincoln's approval before his death. The painting depicts Ceres, the goddess of grain, in the blue dress, sitting on a McCormick Reaper with the young America in a red cap. I mean, come on. If we're not important, important part of American history, who is? You know, my, my joke is, and somebody here was telling me Freightliner jokes earlier, but I don't see Freightliner up there at all. <laughs> Maybe a good company, but not there. Um, and I think most of you know this, but after the Civil War, um, Lincoln's Secretary of War said that without the McCormick Reaper, the North would not have won the war and the nation would have been divided. Each machine freed up about five farmhands to go off and fight the war. And this is a little ironic because Obviously, Cyrus himself was a southerner, but his machine kept the North in bread and, you know, freed up got boys to go off and fight the war. Um, so in 1847, after years of minimal production in Virginia, Cyrus moved his business to Chicago and built his first factory near the mouth of the Chicago River. He knew he needed to be closer to his Midwestern customers. At the time, Chicago's population was 16,000 um, but it was the fastest growing city in the world. Um, and as you can see, his small manufacturing operation just continued to grow. Um, this is what it looked like. Um, the river at the time 
was different than the river we know today. The idea of sightseeing tourist <coughs> boats was impossible to imagine. The foul-smelling river was crowded with working schooners that functioned as delivery trucks of the day. This is before they reversed the flow of the Chicago River. So, I know it's after dinner. It was, it was polluted like you can't possibly imagine. Um, in the lower left and right, you can see a bridge that stands where the Michigan Avenue Bridge is today. I don't know, how many of you know Chicago? Um, the bridge would swivel on a small piece of land in the middle of the river. And there's McCormick's plant over there <coughs> on the left. Um, this is where that would be today, if you visit Chicago. Um, I think that's the Booth, uh, University of Chicago Booth School of Business there. Right? Um, and, and you can see the building right behind it, the equitable building, where the company had offices for years and years, and just to the right out of the frame here is the NBC Tower, which is also where we had offices. So they were honoring the original location by where they put the office buildings. Um, after the fire, and you can see the fire here indicated in pink on the map, and yellow is where McCormick's plant was. I mean, his plant was burned to the ground. 62-year-old Cyrus, um, <coughs> considered retiring and not rebuilding his only factory. Uh, they had millions. Some people tell me they were living in New York. I'm not so sure. But um, it was his young wife, Nettie, 37-year-old Nettie, that said, no, Cyrus, you're going to rebuild. Our children need work. And they were multi, multi-billionaires. They, they did not need work. Millionaires, please. Um, so this is the new plant. Um, and even with this much larger facility, Cyrus's brother, Leander, the plant manager, <coughs> couldn't keep up with demand. I mean, they just couldn't build enough reapers. Um, Cyrus fired his brother and hired a guy from the Colt Firearms Company who added a second shift, duh, and, 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 and introduced the concept of standardized interchangeable parts. This revolutionary idea eliminated the need for thousands of skilled craftsmen and opened the door for a less skilled labor force. So this was, this was, I mean, they weren't the first to standardize interchangeable parts, but certainly one of the first five companies in the U.S. anyway that did it. Um, this is what the Reaper Works looked like in Chicago, um, and as was common at the time, and I think, um, Sarah, in some of your photos, you had a similar setup uh, on the farm, but one master steam engine powered all these workstations. And, you know, by today's standards, you know, how dangerous, what OSHA would say to all those <laughs> flying belts and pulleys. I mean, it would be disastrous. Um, here in my short presentations at work, I'm trying to show the McCormick era products in one slide. Um, it's a gross oversimplification, but in the lower right is the twine binder, and that, you know, I think I have another slide. That could cut, and we licensed that technology. We didn't invent the Nodder technology. But that reaper, one person could cut 50 acres and bind it in a single day, where 50 years earlier, McCormick's machine could cut five acres with two people and no binding. So I mean, it was incredible progress. Um, you know the story about the merger. I'm sure I don't have to go into that here. Um, but you know, after the merger, the company owned an 85% market share in the farm equipment business and by the 1920s was the fourth largest company in the United States. And there again, I get a gasp from the Europeans. <coughs> they, they, you know, I don't know what they thought they were buying with Navistar, but I don't think they knew that. Now, this is one of my favorite stories. Um, so they work with um, John D. Rockefeller, who was the father-in-law uh, of Harold, um, recommended his fr friend J.P. Morgan um, financier Morgan to put the deal together. Morgan hired George Perkins to manage the deal and because five of the companies had significant holdings overseas it was Perkins that named us international. And the McCormicks and the Deerings could agree on almost nothing so Perkins appointed Clarence Funk, the gangster guy <laughs> looking here, um, to, to, to control the day-to-day -day operations. Eventually Rockefeller loaned the McCormicks five million dollars and they bought out the Deerings. Um, this is our Springfield, Ohio plant, and that came to us as part of the merger. That's why we're in Springfield today. It's not on the same footprint 
Um, but that's why we're in Springfield. Um, okay, and now truck history. So I was a graphic designer. This is my second career. I was a graphic designer in Chicago for 40 years. And I worked on the Navistar account. I designed a big book called Milestones. Spent two years on it um, and got hooked on the history. Studied it at night when the book was published. Um, and that's how I got here. Um, but a lot of my presentation here is visual. So if you couldn't hear me at all, I'll try to be articulate and succinct. But if you didn't hear anything, the pictures here are, you know, tell an incredible story. Um, and, you know, we're missing the scalp in here and the light line. But, um, so here's Ed Johnson again that we, we talked about earlier. He invented the first gas engine. He took one of his stationary engines, put it on a stationary platform, and developed the first tractor. Um, he developed buggy, and the auto buggy and the auto wagon. Um, Vaughn's right, he quit on a patent dispute with Cyrus Jr., went to Keystone. Cyrus Jr. wrote to him. Cyrus Jr. called him. Jr. took the train out, had lunch with him, tried to convince him to come back. Johnston said, hell no, I love it here, I'm not coming back. And then Jr. just bought the company and Johnston was back for another 40 years or something. I mean, he has 171 patents with the company. So um, he was, he was a, a genius guy and Jr. knew it when he, when he met him. Um, I'm, I'm trying to put some I argued with myself about this, these kind of stupid rubber stamp category things here, but uh, these were experimentals. Um, you know, Johnston did his buggy. Um, the one, Johnston drove that buggy to work for two or three years before he could convince Cyrus Jr. to start building trucks and buggies. Um, and Deering was also at this, you know, before the merger. Deering actually had a gasoline engine before we did. Um, and originally, the idea was this is a product for the elite, so we're going to market it to the wealthy and even, don't take me wrong here, anybody, any woman in the room, but they were even going to market it to women. I mean, think about the time. That was, that was kind of a revolutionary idea. Um, soon, it didn't take very long for everybody to realize this truck, bus, buggy could do more than just all people around and you know people started to take the back seats out um, make them into trucks and you know soon they moved from the farm into the city and that was I mean the farms were a big market but the city was just you know incredible and we started to get improvements like a water-cooled engine the earlier ones you know were all air-cooled like my little Volkswagen Beetle I had back in the 60s. Um, and maybe as, po as powerful as. Um, we stayed in the automobile business for a few years. I think you've seen some of these at the shows. Um, George Mitchell, I think that's his yellow and blue one there. Um, it was, there were improvements here. They, you know, the pneumatic tires, they moved the engine under the hood um, and they used something that they called a gear type rear axle rather than chain. Before that, everything was a chain drive. Um, and chain drives continued on beyond this, but this is where they first started to use actual gears. Um, you know, city and country. Um, just, I, I, I love the, the, the truck out on the farm with the, the family, um, I don't know what, picking cabbage or something. This is a photo I found just recently. So, so this is a 1915 Model M auto wagon. And in 1914, August Pruhoff invented the fifth wheel. So people were trying to figure out how to haul trailers. And here this guy, you know, rigged up something himself. And I think there was a lot of that going on um, before, you know, Pruhoff made his magic work. We, we didn't build trucks for trailers until 1924, but there was a need for them. It was an obvious need for them. Um, this series I love. Um, we have one in our collection. Um, there were, you know, like light, medium, and heavy, but all the same 
kind of look, that sloped hood. Um, we say, we admit it in our literature. We didn't have industrial designers back then. In our literature, we say, our truck is um, Renault-like. You know, what, what I would have said my, as a kid, Renault-like, but Renault-like. They, they admit in the product literature that we've actually copied a, a European automobile style here. Um, but it was, it was a very popular truck. Um, and I don't know any of you, you've probably all seen these before, but with the hood open, that engine's in backwards, and that's how it was planned. Um, my friend George Kirkham, I asked him about, I wanted to illustrate this, and he went over to his museum on his lunch hour, took these photos and sent them to me last time. You know, in the air intake, the radiators were on the side, um, at the, uh, Firewall, it, worked. It, just, it worked. I, I can't believe it worked, but it worked. Um, you know, those trucks got bigger and bigger. I love the, the wheels on the right. Um, that's working in an orchard. Um, you know, they, those aren't rubber tires. I think those are metal steel wheels, like on an old steel wheel tractor. And, and the thing in the upper left, that's a fifth wheel, but that's handmade by somebody. That's not a, you know, we didn't do that till 1924. Um, but I don't know, cool, cool trucks. Um, and this is one of my favorites. I have a category here called oddballs. Um, somebody took one of our trucks and made it into a locomotive of sorts, slash train car. And um, apparently it worked, but I've never seen such a thing. This isn't a um, kind of truck you have today, uh, a high rail or a road rail truck. This was designed to be a train car slash locomotive. Um, it was this series where we created our first buses. We saw um, coach builders buying our trucks and converting them to buses. And by 1915, we said, we can do that. And so we got into the bus business and it's been very successful for us ever since. That illustration, the yellow bus, that's an artist's version of that. It would have been black. Um, yellow buses didn't come in until the 1930s. Um, and we were hedging our bets when we built these first buses. This one is a convertible. It can be, uh, you know, bus by day and truck by night. Um, it didn't last, you know, didn't last long, but they weren't quite sure if they were gonna be in the bus business or not. Tom, they you might, you might explain why we had the radiator where it was on that, that model truck. Because why? Why, why, why we put... I, I don't know, we, we copied the sloped hood style and... No, it was to prevent... The oh, well, it did that. Yes. It, it, the Teamsters, the Teamsters at the time, manage teams of horses. And I don't know if this is a mythical tale or the truth, but I've heard it many times. But Teamsters would travel through town at night and smash the radiators of any motorized vehicle they could find because they hated the idea. Um, you know, they, they wanted to preserve their role as controlling transportation. Um, and this truck didn't do that. You, you could smash this pretty good and not damage the truck, so. Uh, that was an advantage. Um, and there's a, a summary of our bus business. Um, you know, I love the one in the lower right uh, with the kids looking out the window, but there were, you know, the bus bodies were wooden at first and just like our trucks and eventually became metal. Um, that's our plant today. Um, it's, there's a mile long production line there. Um, it's pretty pretty impressive. Um, this, this series, um, I don't know, I, it, it followed the, the sloped hood. We finally got to building real trucks. They got bigger, heavier, more powerful. Um, you know, the, the, the steering now was um, on the, where it is today before it was on the other side of the truck. Um, 
So the three series followed by the four series. The four series was really our first severe duty truck. One of these trucks, um, no, one of these models, or many of these models were helped used to build the New York subway system, a small portion of it. But they worked on it for a couple years and there were probably a dozen of our trucks on the site. Um, that's an early tractor trailer of ours and you know, check out the chain. Can you imagine how dangerous that might be? I mean, just, I mean, and look how primitive that whole operation is. Just crazy. Um, then came the speed truck. So when Springfield plant stopped converting, remember we got that Springfield plant as part of the merger. Um, they converted it in the 1920s to build trucks and the S series were the first series of trucks to come out of that plant. And the S truck, S stood for speed, and we were so proud of the fact that our trucks could go 25 miles an hour. We were gonna name the whole series of trucks for that one attribute, speed. Um, we have one of these trucks in our collection, a, a speed truck and an S series truck. And to fill it with gas, um, you open up the passenger door and take the gas cap off where the glove box would be in your truck today. So I don't know, it just seems crazy, goofy, difficult to me, but that's where it was. Uh, also, these trucks sold in Japan. I mean, we were international. We were, I did a presentation, um, I don't know, six, five, six years ago, I called Truly International, and we were just all over the globe. Um, here, I'm doing a, working on a video for Tony Sutton, um, who's our senior VP of research and development. And he wants me to collect photos of every model truck we've ever built and every variant of every model. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and I've been working on it with my son for a year and a half now. Um, and that's only a small part of the video. Then we're gonna have films of the plants and running trucks. And it, I'd love to see it. It might take, might be a three hour movie, but I'd, I'd love to see it. Um, but I, I started to count how many models, trucks we had in different decades. And this is just the 20s. And it got much worse than this as time went on. But my friend George Kirkham said, well, every time we made a new wheelbase, we called it a new model. I mean, you know, small changes that would just be an option today became an entirely new model. Um, There's some S-series trucks that just, I love the fire engine, um, but they were big, they were small, they were heavy, they were light. Um, this is at the Chatham plant. I just love that photo. Uh, and who, who was asking about their six-speed special today? Um, yes, they built six-speed specials in Chatham. Um, we, we were getting pressure to have a more powerful engine. Um, our, we had a, an engine, a 283 cubic inch engine that developed 29.6 horsepower. Um, so we made a deal with the, the Hall Scott engine people and got their much more powerful uh, 312 cubic inch engine that could develop uh, 48 horsepower. It, it, it changed a lot of things. This was the truck used to build the Hoover Dam. That, that's George Kirkham's, probably the only truck left from the Hoover Dam project and it's just beautifully restored. Um, so we had an exclusive contract. We supplied all the trucks to build the Hoover Dam. Our trucks ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three years, often in 100 degree heat. Um, we proved to the world that our trucks um, were the most durable and dependable trucks. Um, that rig on the right, I don't know if you know the Hoover Dam story, but they, to build the dam, they had to get all the water out of the river. So they built um, tunnels on either side through solid rock to get the water to run around and then they could come down and build the dam on dry ground. Um, this rig would back up into the tunnel, um, three levels there. Guys go up with like six foot long drills, drill into the hard rock, stuff in dynamite, drive out, 
it would blow up. And so if this truck, truck looks a little beat up, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, uh, there, there's a reason for that. Driving that truck was not a job you wanted. No, no, <laughs> no I, mean, I, I mean, driving out of there or any spark. Or, Start it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and here's the answer to Vaughn's question earlier. There's the multiple S series trucks. I just, I, there, there were two W series and there may have been other duplicates, but I don't know why, what, what the fascination is with the letter S, but it, it worked. Um, the A series trucks, um, bigger again, heavier. Um, the first, these are the first ones that had, you see there the red arrow, the um, saddle position for a gas tank. So it, wasn't any longer underneath the driver's seat or something. It was a little further removed. Um, the B series was all about options. There were dozens of them, um, including an option for a three-man cab. Um, and the C series, one of our most beautiful lines of trucks, you know, Art Deco inspired in the 30s. Um, and when I was working in industrial design, I have two jobs sometimes at Navistar. Um, when I was working in industrial design, all my friends said, well, Tom, you know that's really based on a Chevrolet. So we were again, we were again copying. Uh, we didn't have a stylist or an industrial designer. It wasn't until Ted Ornis came on that we had somebody that could really design a truck. Um, and recently, I don't know if this is important, but um, every year we, Things, we have a cold storage system in Chicago Pacific. Um, those are custom trucks there at the bottom. But look at those things. That, you know, there, there are four of them, and they're at least, look at the ladders, they're at least two or three stories high to get into the cab. Um, they're pulling a, what, 198 wheel trailer in South Africa. Um, the Transtar, just a beautiful truck in my opinion. Um, Transtar conventional, we, you know, everybody liked the cab over Transtar, so the next conventional truck decided to call it a Transtar. Oops. The premium conventional, um, we brought in a designer from the outside, Larry Shinoda. Um, he's known for his work on the 63 and 68 Corvette Stingrays and on the 1970 Boss 302 Mustang. So he was a heavy hitter, and I think these trucks are just just incredibly cool. Um, here we have one of these that's ours on the left, the Sightliner, and it's four feet from the front bumper to the back of the cab. So I can't get in there. I mean, I'm obviously overweight, but I think you need to weigh about 110 pounds to get in there <laughs> behind that wheel. I mean, it is just it's claustrophobic. Um, we experimented like everybody else did with gas turbine engines in the 60s. And you know, I, I always imagined the, the problem was the gearing, you know, those, a turbine engine just runs, you know, just screams. And I thought to gear that down at a stoplight or something would be just, you know, crazy. And it wasn't, it's the fuel efficiency. Those engines are just burning fuel like you cannot believe. So that's why nobody ever built um, a gas turbine truck. Um, the M series, uh, a really serious, severe duty truck. Um, and I, I'm, I read it was available with a third frame rail. Um, I, I've never seen a truck with three frame rails. Uh, and it, it was popular for the Air Force's Red Horse Battalion construction group. So. It had a place. Um, the S series, I think, just a beautiful series of trucks. Um, Fred Crisman, in his book, he asserts that when everything was going to hell at Harvester, we we're losing money, the S series kept us afloat. The S series just kept selling and selling and selling. Everything else was falling apart, but this is the truck that may have saved us. Um, the DT-466, we were discussing that with somebody here at the bar a little bit ago. Um, our most famous engine, the Legend. Um, those are the first trucks it went into, but it also went into tractors and construction equipment. Um, this truck 
we saw it earlier in that construction equipment slide. Um, Roger Amato, who I know from the Story of Historical Construction Equipment Society, wrote a paper on this truck and says, we built it in response to owning this pile scraper and rather than scraping all that dirt and then hauling it with the same vehicle, we would load it into these oversized dump trucks. I, I'm not sure that's true, but it seems possible. By, by the mid 70s, um, we'd sold 5 million tractors and 5 million trucks. Today our truck count is over 10 million. Um, you know, people always ask what happened, where all the trouble came from. Um, you know, after the war, um, we had excess manufacturing capacity. And rather than shoring up our aging factories, the company expanded into non-core businesses, including lawn tractors, construction equipment, freezers, sorry, sorry, re re refrigerators, um, and even work for NASA. You saw that earlier, so I won't go into it. But uh, we were doing, and we did it again 10 years ago, get into these side businesses. We're back now focused on our core business, so you saw. And we kept offering this multitude of trucks, 12 different models. I mean, you know, you, you, how do you make money on all that? And it got, it got worse. The R series trucks had um, 30 or 29 different engine options. So imagine if you're a parts guy or you, you get, how do you even as a salesman, how do you pick the right engine for your customer? I mean, it just, it, it, it's crazy. Um, we did this already, I think. Um, the R series got worse. In 1965, there were 11, 111 different models and 950 major variants. So, I mean, the parts guys just, nobody could stock the right parts. It was just, the dealers were very frustrated with all this. And that, you know, led to a lot of troubles. Um, the Cargo Star, I love it. I'm previously a CO Load Star, now a Cargo Star. Um, you know, by the 70s, the company recognized it was overextended uh, with the post-war diversification High legacy costs from retirees' pensions and unprecedented competition at home and abroad. The company came to the brink of a collapse. Um, a prolonged strike added to the woes. So management made the difficult decision to downsize its operations dramatically to better fit its new reality. Um, so they sold off all these parts, including the closed Fort Wayne and including the ag business and the IH name, and reemerged as Navistar. But we kept the color, and you know, I mean, Case has the red color and the IH name. And those are the two tractors I've ever driven um, up in Racine. Uh, they didn't let me, I drove them, but there was somebody sitting right over my shoulder <laughs> watching every move. Uh, the, the one on the right drove like a car a little bit. The one on the left, there was only one, I said, I'm gonna turn on this cross street here, the gravel road. He says, well, start turning now. And I, I, I was 30, 40, 50 feet away from, no, start turning now. And I, I eventually got the hang of it, but it does city, not. City boy. Yeah, yeah <laughs> suburban, <laughs> suburban, I think. Um, you know, today we have four plants, three truck plants and an engine plant. Um, the one in San Antonio is altogether brand new and should be able to develop build a lot of trucks there soon. <coughs> um, there's the Proving Grounds I talked to about with somebody here, Studebaker and, and Bendix. Um, that's ours today. We've really revamped that a lot. But some people call this the QSP series, some people call it the Thousand series, but it was our earliest step into aerodynamics. Um, I think these are cool. A lot of the people I know think these trucks were all Especially the interior is just crappy plastic, um, and you know. So I, I don't. I've never sat in one, but I think they're cool looking. Uh, but you know, I guess truck guys like chrome no matter what. So whenever anybody bought one of these trucks, the first 
aftermarket product was a chrome snap-on grill. You know, as they go. They had to have a chrome grill no matter what. Now, I'm a designer. I think this is modernistic, but I can't convince anybody. I think most of you know about this Endeavor 3. Um, you know, it's using our, the look of our, you know, QSP series trucks. Uh, it, 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 and this is at, uh, it was at Fort Wayne at homecoming a year ago or something. And I just, I, I mean, I'm, so I'm, I'm a guy who likes the idea of electric trucks. But this thing with a 12-cylinder diesel engine revving its engine, I mean, there was black clouds of smoke you could probably see from three miles away, and the ground was shaking, and it was, it was, it was cool. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm not for air pollution. I'm, I, I love clean air, but th this was an impressive beast. And I don't know if any of you remember this, the Unistar. Um, the, this was built for traction in the mountains and the snow. Um, the front wheels would automatically engage as drive wheels if the rear wheels were spinning. And I've never heard of such a thing but uh, until recently. And I understand it was just a beast. Once the front wheels were powered, steering it was very difficult at best. Um, in experimental trucks, we did this idea truck in the 90s, it, it went further into aerodynamics and did little things like see the mirrors there in that front view. Well, that's you know, one's higher, one's lower because that's how it worked. That's what the driver needed. So it, it was a really serious study. Um, the 9000 series just ran forever. Everybody loved them. I wrote an article uh, when we built the last uh, the last one. It was. And our idea then was, we're only going to build aerodynamic trucks because that's what people can afford. Uh, we had uh, Walmart as a client when I was in industrial design, and they were spending a billion dollars a year on fuel. And if you can improve the aerodynamics by 1% on your truck, that's a lot of money. Um, so we quit this, and then we built the HX, as a severe duty, you know, construction truck. Now people are taking them, making them tractors, and again we're building flat-faced, non-aerodynamic highway trucks. But you know, we, we tried. We, we thought we were doing the right thing. I think most of you know this story: the wild thing, the Cummins engine. Um, just, and this is at Fort Wayne. If you go to homecoming, um, this. The, these trucks are still on the road everywhere, the NGV series. Um, I like them, but this is what, when the new designers came in, um, they looked at this and said, first thing we do on our new series of trucks, we're getting rid of the smiley face grill, which John referenced. But it, I thought it was cool, but once I see it as a smiley face, it's kind of hard to unsee it. Um, so the new trucks are meaner and tougher looking. Um, the XT series, I, just, I love this. I mean, it was, it was great PR. Uh, I worked at, I mean, this is how I got here. I worked at Navistar's ad agency when we did this photo shoot in the upper left um, of the CXT. And that's a big truck. It's a really big truck. But we looked for a male model to sit with that truck. And we looked for the shortest, smallest male model we could find so that the truck looks, you know, gi gigantic. But, and the MXT led to the, the military MXT, which, you know, is still in production today. So this wasn't a complete bust. Um, the Lone Star and the um, Harley Davidson Lone Star. I, I think the Harley Lone Star is the coolest truck ever built on this planet. Uh, we couldn't make money selling even one of them. I mean, we lost money every time we sold one because we had to pay Harley so much in royalty. So we stopped. We have kits. Uh, we could still go back and build them, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. Please uh, don't order one. Yeah, you're right. Don't <laughs> order one. Um, in 2018, we sold off most of our Navistar defense business, but in 2003, we introduced the M ramp. This truck's unique hull design does an incredible job of protecting against improvised explosives. It has saved more than 10,000 lives to date. 
So I've met guys who come up to me when I'm showing this, well, six, eight years ago, had this at a outdoor something, truck fest, I don't know. Um, and guys would come up and say, yeah, me and my buddies were in that truck and we're all here today. And, you know, it's, it's impressive. Even if we own only a little bit of that business now, it's a good thing. Um, you know, things we do, we have Diamond Logic Builder. It helps us wire, or bodybuilders wire our trucks. It's the easiest, um, you know, programmable controls for the customer. Um, when we got into this business, um, our competitors like Freightliner, all the wiring in that truck was white. And when you get into our truck, everything is color coded. And we, everybody's caught up to us, but this was a very big innovation. And I work with on-command connection a lot still as a designer. Um, and, uh, you know, we use data analytics to help our customers understand the health and performance of their fleet. So, kind of big deal. Um, in New Zealand, um, we're building trucks down there, you know, export trucks, cab over trucks, um, that are just, I think they're cool. Um, but people here in marketing don't even know about, I mean, Chicago doesn't know much about what's going on in New Zealand. Um, and I think they just changed this, but um, very recently they were building Pro Stars down there. And we discontinued the Pro Star years ago. Um, now, now I think they're calling them RHs, I mean, they're, they're regional halls. And it, it's a different, it's very similar, but a different truck. Um, this is our great experimental truck, the Catalyst Super Truck 1. Um, all kinds of efficiencies, no mirrors, all video cameras, all lightweight materials, um, all that skirting. It, it's, it's a government funded project. Um, we get paid by the government. And now we're on Super Truck 2. And it's, we struggled, we didn't build the trailer for Super Truck 1. In Super Truck 2, we got to build the trailer as well, and there were lots of efficiencies to be had there. So, I'm, I haven't seen this one live in person yet. Um, joint ventures and supply agreements with Ford and GM throughout our history. Um, you know, we th this Power Stroke diesel we built for Ford. Um, we were shipping four to five hundred of these engines a day for years and years, and and. Uh, it, it put $2 billion extra on our bottom line every year. So this was, you know, even when we were struggling or somebody said they didn't like the Navistar trucks, this business alone was, this and earlier, the, the military business, there are a lot of things that kept us afloat during difficult times. We've been experimenting with alternate fuels. Um, most of you know, um, you know, the, the fuels in the 50s and 60s. Um, we tried now, um, you know, compressed natural gas, we've tried propane, but now we're all electric, or we're going electric. Um, these are our two electric products today, both very successful, very expensive, but the maintenance is minimal. I mean, and people are buying that idea and it's working. Um, bad times, around 2012, we brought in new management, um, changed the corporate culture, uh, ensured the financial stability, um, it, it worked. It, it went fast and it was successful, but it was, it was scary. This is our lineup today um, without the bus. It's gonna put a bus in there. Um, you know, this is the, the trucks we build. Um, my friend George, who sells international trucks for the last 40 years, says we're building better trucks today than ever in the past. Um, and this is where we are, Trayton. We're one of many in this group. We're the smallest in this group, um, but it seems to be going really well. So th thank you. Sorry I ran long, or real long. Thank you.